the Roaring Twenties. It was also called the Jazz Age or the Age of Ballyhoo or even the Age of Wonderful Nonsense. In the 1920s, the United States enjoyed its greatest prosperity ever. And so here we see the image of Uncle Sam representing American business and President Coolidge as a doctor. And the caption reads, sound as a dollar. <clears throat> this cartoon is from 1927. <clears throat> so to appreciate um, the strength of the American economy during the 1920s, one of every three Americans owned a phonograph, a car, or a telephone. The state of Kansas had more cars than the entire country of France in the 1920s. During the, that decade, America owned half of the world's gold supply. 42% of all goods produced in the world came from the United States. So in other words, <clears throat> the China today rep is similar to America in the 1920s in terms of uh, production of goods. No other country in history enjoyed as much affluence as the United States enjoyed in the 1920s. And the reasons are not difficult to find. Uh, this comes on the heels of World War I. World War I devastated previous economic world leaders, such as Great Britain and Germany. The United States was the only country who was not damaged by World War I. In fact, the United States profited from World War I. Um, while Europe was at war, they were desperate for American goods. And so the 1920s was this decade of uh, seemingly endless prosperity. In 1926, Irving Berlin wrote Blue Skies, which was the tenor of the times, this unending prosperity. You're probably familiar with the song. Uh, it probably sounded something like this in the 1920s. <laughs> Blue sky smiling at me, nothing but blue skies do I see. I won't <laughs> plague you with any further singing, but when you look at the words, bluebirds singing a song, nothing but bluebirds all day long, and it finishes, blue days, ah, all of them gone, nothing but blue skies from now on. So there was a sense that, yes, Americans were enjoying prosperity, and that prosperity would last forever. When Americans elected Herbert Hoover president in 1928, oh, uh, this is one of the uh, choruses of Blue Skies, never saw the sun shining so bright, never saw things going so right. When Herbert Hoover was elected in 1928, the mood of uh, optimism and confidence uh, was widespread. And here is a poster of Hoover's uh, campaign, a chicken in every pot, a car in every garage. For the first time in the 1920s, ordinary Americans began to invest in stocks. And by 1929, there seemed to be no limit as to how high stock prices could go. Unlike earlier days when millions of dollars were made in steel or oil, in the 1920s, you could make a, for a fortune simply by buying paper. What I mean is that stocks really had no value at that time except for what people were willing to pay for it. And in the 1920s, people were willing to pay higher and higher prices for stocks because they were sure that the price of the stock would continue to rise and that at some point in the future, they would then sell. So the reason for this confidence in the stock market is that for the eight years prior to 1929, stock prices rose almost consistently, as you can see from this uh, Dow Jones indices, indices from 1920 
up to 1929. So it made sense to invest in the stock market. Even if you didn't even know the company whose stock you're buying, it didn't matter. As long as you were confident that next week and next year, the price would be higher. So you would be profiting. So Americans were invest in investing in the stock market um, because banks were making money more readily available at lower interest rates to more and more people. And so many people took out loans, not just to buy cars, but also to buy stock. And these rising stock prices encouraged further increased investments and those increased buying of stock pushed the prices even higher. Now, when you loan money to buy stock, it's called buying on margin. So in the 1920s, you could buy a stock for only 10% down. So you could, um, <clears throat> you're confident that the price is gonna go up. So you pay only 10% for the stock because you expect in a few months later, you'll be able to pay off the balance of the initial investment um, by selling the stock and you would then sell it for a profit. And that's fine as long as stock prices keep going up. So this investment strategy turned the stock market really into a speculative pyramid game in which most of the money invested in the market didn't actually exist. Most of it was being borrowed from the banks. But despite this outward prosperity, there were weaknesses in the economy in the 1920s, although very few people realized it at the time. So what were these structural weaknesses of the American economy during the 1920s? Well, one was growing income disparity. By 1932, 1% of the population owned 59% of the wealth in the United States. Now, that's some cause for worry today because the 1%, top 1% 1 of the population today owns um, a vast majority of the wealth in the United States. So if we look at this chart here, we can see um, the bars in this maroon color represent the wealthiest fifth. And so you can see that 47.4% of all the wealth in America was owned by the wealthiest fifth in 1918, then 51% of all the wealth by 1921. 52.3% by 1929. Now, farmers and workers did not share in this prosperity of the 1920s. This is a chart of wheat prices from 1925 to 1933. And we can see that the price per bushel in dollars went from about a dollar fifty per bushel in 1925 to about fifty cents a bushel in 1931. Well, um, why were farm prices declining in the 1920s? Well, for one thing, uh, let me just go back to this chart again. For one thing, farmers were overproducing. During World War I, when Europe was at war, American farmers were feeding Europeans. Europe was a prime market for American wheat, uh, rice, uh, tomatoes, any farm products. But when the war ended, Europe began to produce their own farm products. But American farmers continued to overproduce. And so there was a glut of farm products. And when supply is much higher than demand, 
then prices go down. And so farmers generally were suffering during the 1920s. So were industrial workers. Here's a list of average weekly earnings for manufacturing workers from 1920 to 1929. And what we see is that the average weekly earnings were decreasing. Um, now, this at a time when the cost of living was increasing. So that meant that workers were not sharing in the general prosperity. Uh, most industrial workers put in a 48 hour work week in the 1920s. There was no paid vacation and retirement was really an elusive fantasy for most workers. So the fact is that the average American worker in the 1920s worked to the, up until the day the worker died. So much of this seeming prosperity of the 1920s was really an illusion. Prior to the 1920s, the average worker could not borrow money, didn't have enough collateral. But in the 1920s, credit became a way of life. The phrase was buy now and pay later. But this easy credit also left many people in debt. And so, Throughout the early part of the 20s, there was tremendous consumer purchasing. But people were buying on credit. And you can't buy on credit forever. At some point, you're going to have to pay your bills. And when that becomes difficult, consumer purchases fall off. And that is what happened by the end of the 1920s. Another structural pro problem of the 1920s was that the stock market was unregulated. There was no government oversight for the stock market in the 1920s. And the fact is that the stock market was not on the up and up. Speculators would not investigate the health of the company whose stock they were buying. They didn't even think it was important. The only thing that mattered was that they had faith and confidence that the stock price would continue to rise. And stock prices could be manipulated by Wall Street insiders. So here's a cartoon of Caveat Empta Investments Limited. And the CEO says, let's start a rumor that we've all resigned. That should jump up our stocks, the stock prices. Well, this is a humorous cartoon, but it really symbolizes how uh, Wall Street insiders could manipulate stock prices. So, for example, a pool of wealthy investors could inflate the price of stock by bribing newspapers to write good stories about the companies they invested in. And all the financial journals of the 1920s, including the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, they were on the take. It was easy to bribe journalists. And so the game was rigged when insiders then decided to sell their stock to unwitting small investors. Even Al Capone branded the stock market as crooked. <laughs> An economist, Roger Babson, warned that prices could not go up forever and that the market would soon crash. But he was reviled and accused of being unpatriotic. One final structural problem of the 1920s had to do with the isolationism of the 1920s. Isolationism means that the United States wanted little or nothing to do with the rest of the world during the 1920s. Now, what was the reason for this? Well, way back in 1796, 
George Washington, in his farewell address, said that Europe has a set of problems that have nothing to do with the United States. And European countries are always at each other's throats. Therefore, it is best for the United States to have nothing to do with Europe. Because if we did, we would get sucked into their controversies and conflicts. That the only relationship we should have with Europe is through trade. But we should make no political alliances with European countries. And the United States followed Washington's advice from 1796 until 1917, when the United States entered World War I. Then President Wilson announced that we were entering World War I to make the world safe for democracy. We would fight a war that would end all wars. So America went into World War I with a great sense of idealism. But the war ended with harsh treaties that punished the defeated nations. And these harsh treaties sowed the seeds for World War II. And so many Americans were disillusioned after World War I. This war that was supposed to end all wars really was a war that made another war inevitable. In addition, the United States loaned money to many of the nations in World War I, and these nations failed to pay back their war debts. In fact, only one country did. And if we were playing Trivial Pursuit, I would ask you, which country was that? Some of you probably know it was Finland. But all the other countries never paid back their war debts. And so the general feeling on the street in America was, let's not have anything to do with these countries in the future. And so the United States refused to join the League of Nations, which was created after World War I, which by the way, was the brainchild of the American president, Woodrow Wilson. But the US Senate rejected membership in the League of Nations, which was another sign of isolationism. And in 1921 and 1924, Congress passed a very severe Immigration Quota Act to reduce the number of immigrants coming into America. Again, another expression of isolationism that we want nothing to do with the rest of the world. And so this cartoon uh, represents that feeling that the United States would build a wall to insulate itself from the rest of the world. Another facet of isolationism in the 1920s was our tariff policy. During the 1920s, Congress enacted very high protective tariffs. It was called the fordney mccumber Tariff. And it raised a tax on imported goods. Now, the reason for a tariff is that when you tax imported goods, it raises the price of imported goods to consumers. And so it encourages consumers to buy goods produced in the United States. The 1920s had three Republican presidents and the Republican party supported business interests. And so the Republican dominated Congress enacted the Fordney McCumber tariff to protect American businesses by making foreign goods more expensive. But the problem with a high tariff is that other countries then retaliate with a tariff of their own against American products. And so it becomes more difficult to sell American products abroad. So uh, by the spring of 1929, steel production was beginning to decline. Uh, the construction industry was very sluggish car sales began to drop 
And this is all because buying on credit meant that at some point you would have to pay the bill. Many Americans were left deeply in debt. Consumer spending had tailed off. And as a result of all of this, large sections of the American population were poor and getting even poorer. Now let's look at the stock market. There's a famous story, which may or may not be true, about how in the late summer of 1929, a shoeshine boy gave Joe Kennedy a stock tip. And Joe Kennedy, the father of John F. Kennedy, was a very wise investor, and he thought, if shoeshine boys are giving stock tips, then it's time to get out of the market. So according to the story, Joe Kennedy sold all his stocks and he made a killing. And maybe that's the beginning of the fortune that made John F. Kennedy president three decades later. Now, when we look at the slowdown of the economy by the spring of 1929, you would think that markets would reflect the economic slowdown. But instead, prices, stock prices soared to record heights. And that's sort of similar to what's going on today. It's almost inexplicable that today, with the economy in a tailspin, that is not reflected in the stock prices today. The uh, S&P indices broke a record. Dow Jones prices continue to increase today. And that was the case in the spring of 1929. So despite these troubling signs in the economy, prices of stock continue to rise. As you can see here, all the way up till October of 1929. Borrowing hit unprecedented heights as people continue to buy on margin convinced that this stock market boom would never end. Then in September of 1929, uh, stock prices began to fluctuate, but market analysts dismissed this as just temporary. What many of these analysts did not realize or refused to admit was that stock prices were totally out of proportion to the actual profits of these companies. Historians refer to October, that's where things were in the spring of 1929. But October 24th, 1929 was referred to as Black Thursday, when investors decided to sell whatever stock they still had as soon as the market opened. Um, <clears throat> This was the beginning of the great crash. Black Tuesday, the, the two days before, Black Tuesday was the single most devastating financial day in the history of the New York stock market up until that time. On that Tuesday, within the first few hours when the stock market opened, prices collapsed and wiped out all the financial gains of the previous year. Billions of dollars were lost wiping out thousands of the investors. After that, stock prices really had nowhere to go but up. And so there was a short recovery. Um, but overall, prices continued to drop. So if you own stock in the 1920s, and you were confident that prices would continue to rise. And then on Black Tuesday, prices suddenly dropped. You would be inclined to sell your stock because the value of your stock was less on that Tuesday than it was before then. But when you sell your stock, then you are pushing the price of stocks down. And when more people are willing to sell than buy, then stock prices fall the way you see in this chart. 
by 1932, down here at the bottom of the market, stocks were worth only about 20% of the, their value when compared to the summer of 1929. Since most Americans viewed the stock market as the chief indicator of the health of the American economy, the great crash shattered public confidence. Now, most people think that the Great Depression was caused by the stock market crash, but financial historians disagree. They argue that the depression began in 1930 and in 1930, stock market prices were certainly lower than they were in 1929, but they were still relatively high. But the stock market crash of 1929 was a symptom of a weakened economy, and it did act to accelerate the global economic collapse that followed. But the Great Depression really began when banks started failing in the 19th in 1930. And there were more bank failures in 1931 and 1932. So this is where stock prices were in 1930. As you can see, they weren't at the lowest level that would happen in 1932. So this is why uh, economists say that the stock market crash of 1929 did not necessarily cause the depression as compared to 1932. What did cause the depression was the run on banks. Now you may remember the film, It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart, who owns a saving and loans. And when in 1930, everyone wanted to withdraw their money from the banks. Because after all, it was the banks that were loaning money to investors as they bought on margin. And so as stock market prices bottomed out, banks lost millions and millions of dollars that investors could not pay back. And so many banks were closing. In the last 60 days of 1930, 600 banks closed their doors. So here is a chart showing bank failures from 1920 to 1932. So in 1920, 200 banks failed. By 1930, about 2,300 banks were closing every year. Mobs of shouting depositors streamed to teller windows to withdraw their deposits. And to preserve liquidity, banks called in loans, and that put many businesses into bankruptcy. Foreigners began to withdraw gold and capital from American banks, and that caused even more shutdowns. In 1931, 2,294 American banks suspended operation. That was nearly twice as many as 1930. So by then, 1931, public confidence in the American banking system was shattered. By 1933, nearly half of Americans bank, American banks had failed and unemployment was approaching 15 million. Now, 15 million unemployed in 1933 represented 25% of the entire American workforce. In many homes, family income fell to zero, and one in four Americans went to bed hungry. Factories and farms were abandoned. And then a drought plagued the agricultural plain states Soil turned into dust and skies darkened in the middle of the afternoon. The Dust Bowl and farm foreclosures forced farm families to move west in dust covered jalopies. So, this was both an economic and an environmental disaster. 
the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. It was like none other in American history. Now, many Americans thought they were witnessing not just a massive downturn in the stock market, but they thought they were witnessing the collapse of a historic economic, political, and social order, perhaps even the end of the American way of life. This is a very famous photograph of African Americans lined up at a soup kitchen against a billboard that advertised America having the world's highest standard of living, saying there's no way like the American way. Of course, all the people in the car are white. To make matters worse, Congress in 1930 then enacted the highest tariff in American history. It was called the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act. And when Congress enacted this tariff, the stock market went down 30% immediately afterwards. Other countries raised their tariffs. And so American exports decreased by 30%, which only increased unemployment and worsened the Great Depression. Um, you may remember Smoot Hawley from the film uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off, where the history teacher is asking, does anybody know the Smoot Hawley tariff? Anyone? Anyone? But I'm not going <laughs> to ask you that. So to sum things up, the basic reasons for the Great Depression, the unequal distribution of wealth, overproduction in industry and agriculture, particularly in agriculture, that drove farm prices down, buying on credit, which meant that the prosperity of the 1920s, the consumer spending, was really built on a very weak foundation because at some point consumers would have to pay their credit bills and when that happened they stopped buying. Certainly the stock market crash contributed to the depression but it was the bank failures that really plunged the United States into this economic catastrophe. And the president at the time was Herbert Hoover. Who was Herbert Hoover? Well, he was born of Quaker parents. He was an orphan by the age of nine. But he worked his way through college. He earned a degree as a mining engineer. But during the depression of the 1890s, he had to take a job pushing a hand car and shoveling ore getting paid $2.50 a day. However, in his mining operations, he discovered gold in Australia, and he soon became a millionaire. Now, before 1929, the name Hoover was synonymous for food for starving people, medicine for the sick. Now, why was that? Well, during World War I, Herbert Hoover was chairman for Belgium Relief in charge of feeding 10 million starving Europeans. He was the food administrator for the United States. And so his policies ensured an adequate food supply for Americans during the war. And after the war, he headed the economic restoration for Europe distributing 20 million tons of food to 300 million people in Europe. He served for eight years as Secretary of Commerce under Presidents Warren G. Harding and Calvin Coolidge. But he was not a conservative in the Harding-Coolidge mold. Harding and Coolidge were laissez-faire Republicans. That is, they felt that the government should have nothing to do with the economy. No matter how bad things got, the government should not interfere 
with the economy. But Hoover was sympathetic to the progressive wing of the Republican Party. He believed in volunteerism, that in hard times, people should volunteer to help those in need, but that if that didn't help, then government assistance was justified if volunteerism failed. Now, he was elected in November of 1928, when the economy was still prosperous. Did he realize the weaknesses in the American economy when he became president? Now, most people, as I said, believed that the prosperity of the 1920s would continue indefinitely. And Herbert Hoover was one of those people. In his acceptance speech for the Republican Party nomination for the presidency in 1928, he declared, we in America today are nearer to the final triumph over poverty than ever before in the history of any land. The poorhouse is vanishing from among us. This is what he said in 1928. And many Americans shared Hoover's optimism when he took office in March of 1929. In fact, an editorial in the New Year's edition of the New York Times on January 1st, 1929 stated, it has been 12 months of unprecedented advance of wonderful prosperity. If there is any way of judging the future by the past, this new year will be one of felicitation and hopefulness. And of course, the new year that was referred to was the year of 1929. Well, as we know, 1929 would hardly be a year of felicitation and hopefulness. Now, Hoover did recognize that there were some problems with the economy. And so he warned about the dire consequences of a Wall Street orgy of um, buying stocks without any um, concern over the health of the company. He also recognized the fragility of international finances. When we talk about international finances, part of the problem was that Germany, which had been defeated in World War I, was made to pay $33 billion in reparations to the victorious powers, Britain and France. Germany could not make those payments. So American banks loaned money to Germany so Germany could make its reparation payments to Britain and France. Britain and France in turn used that money to help pay off their war debts to the United States. But when the, the, when the uh, economy collapsed, then American bankers could no longer loan money to Germany. Germany could no longer make reparation payments to Britain and France, and Britain and France could no longer make payments for their war debt. So the um, international economy was also on a very weak foundation. Hoover also understood the problems that farmers faced because of overproduction and declining prices for their crops. So he encouraged farmers to voluntarily cooperate to agree to reduce farm production. Well, most farmers felt, I hope other farmers will do that, but I'm not gonna do that. Once the depression hit, Hoover felt if confidence were restored, the system would then right itself. And so he made statements intended to restore confidence, statements that seem ludicrous in retrospect. And it's not that dissimilar from what President Trump has tried to do with the coronavirus. Um, he has tried to make the most positive statements that the virus will disappear, that it will 
not have a severe impact in the United States. And in retrospect, those comments seem ridiculous. Well, this is what Hoover said in 1930, when the depression was just beginning. In February, he said, let's be thankful we're getting back on our feet again, even though there was no evidence that the economy was getting back on its feet. And then in March of 1930, he said, the crisis will be over in 60 days. In June, the worst is over, without a doubt. By September, he said, we have hit bottom and are on the upswing. Again, without any evidence supporting this. And finally, in 1931, he made the most ridiculous statement of all. He said, what our country needs is a good big laugh. If someone could get off a good joke every 10 days, I think our troubles would be over. <clears throat> so I think by 1931, Hoover might have been losing it a little. Now, as I mentioned, he believed in volunteerism and charity. He did not believe in government supported relief payments. He didn't believe that the government should solve economic problems. He thought if the government became involved in the economy, it would plunge the nation into socialism. He also believed in a balanced budget, that there should be no deficit spending. Um, and so if you believe in a balanced budget, then you have to raise taxes in order to balance the budget. But if you raise taxes, then that means even less money is available for consumer spending. And if consumers then spend even less, then more factories close, unemployment increases, and the depression gets worse. So in retrospect, supporting a balanced budget in an economic depression is a catastrophe. Hoover then summoned the leaders of business, labor, and agriculture, and he urged them to adopt a program of voluntary cooperation to bring about a recovery. He implored, implored businessmen not to cut production, not to lay off workers. He asked labor leaders not to demand higher wages or shorter hours. He asked governors and mayors to initiate public work projects to reduce unemployment. But none of these appeals to voluntary action uh, were productive. In December of 1931, he compromised his belief in volunteerism and he began to embrace direct government action. He got Congress to pass the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which provided $500 million in federal loans to businesses that were struggling during the Great Depression. This is what we call the trickle down effect, hoping that if the federal government supports businesses, then that will trickle down and help ordinary people. But critics call this welfare for millionaires. Economic conditions, however, continued to worsen. And so Hoover became even less willing to increase spending, worrying about the balanced budget. In 1932, at the very lowest point of the Depression, he proposed an additional tax increase to avoid a deficit. He finally proposed to Congress $423 million in federal work programs. But by then, the spending was not nearly enough to cope with the growing problem. In May of 1932, a band of jobless World War I veterans began arriving in Washington, D.C. They called themselves the Bonus Expeditionary Force. 
and these World War I de veterans demanded an early payment of a bonus that Congress had promised them for their service in World War I. They were supposed to get this bonus 20 years after the end of the war. That would, that would have meant 1938. But in 1932, many of them were starving. And so they marched on Washington, demanding payment of this bonus. By the end of June, the movement swelled to more than 20,000 tired, hungry, and frustrated men. President Hoover's response was to order the bonus marches to be cleared out. And so, led by General Douglas MacArthur, army troops began pushing the veterans out of Washington. They had set up tents. They had set up huts, which were then set on fire. The sight of the federal government turning on its own citizens, veterans no less, raised doubts in the minds of many Americans about the fate of the Republic. Most Americans blamed Herbert, Herbert Hoover for the Depression. Shanty towns that were built by the unemployed, the homeless, and the destitute, they were called Hoovervilles. An empty pocket turned inside out was called a Hoover flag, and newspapers that covered the homeless in parks were called Hoover blankets. When he was told that Herbert Hoover made less than the $80,000 salary that Babe Ruth demanded in 1921, Babe Ruth was asked, how could you demand a higher salary than the President of the United States? And the Yankee slugger answered, well, I had a better year than the President had. <laughs> One story had it that Hoover was walking down the street with his Secretary of the Treasury, Andrew Mellon, and they passed a phone booth. And Hoover said to Mellon, lend me a nickel, I wanna call a friend. And Hoover said, here's a dime, call both of them. <laughs> the general resentment against Hoover was summed up in a version of the 23rd Psalm. Hoover is my shepherd, I am in want. He maketh me to lie down on park benches. He restoreth my doubt in the Republican party. He guideth me in the path of the unemployed for his party's sake. Yea, though I walk through the alleys of soup kitchens, I am hungry. I do fear evil, for thou art against me. Thy cabinet and thy senate, they do discomfort me. Thou didst prepare a reduction in my wages in the presence of my creditors. Thou anointed my income with taxes, so my expenses overrunneth my income. Surely poverty and hard times will follow all the days of the Republican administration, and I shall dwell in a rented house forever. Amen. So, was all of this criticism of Hoover warranted? Well, I think we have to appreciate that no one in 1929 suspected that the country was teetering on the brink of an economic abyss that would last for more than a decade. It was really an unprecedented economic catastrophe. The last previous depression was in 1893. And so very few people in 1929 were alive to remember it. And that 1893 depression was mild when compared to the Great Depression. Not only that, but reliable data on unemployment didn't exist in the early 1930s. So the full dimension of the problem was really difficult to realize. Also, Hoover wasn't a politician. His first elected office was the presidency. Now, some of you may be thinking that is also true of our president, chief executive, who was not a politician, and whose first elected office was to the White House. And Hoover brought a corporate executive sensibility to the White House at a time when what the nation needed most was bold experimentation. 
And so Hoover faced an unprecedented economic disaster. And so in some ways, his accomplishments were remarkable. He nearly doubled federal public works expenditures in three years, but it was too little too late. What was most damaging to his reputation was that he gave the impression that he didn't care about the suffering that Americans were going through. He was never able to cultivate a warm relationship with the media. He lacked the capacity to be charming. And when he was criticized, he had a tendency to dig in. I know some of you are thinking, hmm, history does repeat itself. And at times, Hoover could become vindictive. He would hire personal detectives to intimidate journalists who were critical of him. And he was also insensitive. He never visited a bread line or a relief kitchen. When his advisors urged him to address the nation on radio to offer comfort and direction, he refused. And he certainly deserves criticism for the way he handled the bonus army. If there was a tragedy about Herbert Hoover, it was that he was a principled man whose commitment to principles would not allow him to be flexible enough to experiment with dealing with the depression. He felt it was okay to aid communities, but not to help individuals. He believed that if you extend charity, you destroy the individual. And he believed that we have no moral right to borrow from the future to pay for today. But the fact is, when Hoover was president, when the stock market crashed, he was, he was president for only six months. So he cannot be blamed for causing the economic disaster. But because he was too inflexible to adopt measures to ease the misery of millions of Americans suffering from the effects of the depression, for that, historians consistently rate him among the least effective presidents of the United States. So this is a <clears throat> poll taken in 2017 of historians to rank presidents from most effective to least effective. And as you can see from this poll, the most effective presidents on the left begin with Abraham Lincoln and the least effective president, Herbert Hoover, came out 37 out of 44 presidents as least effective. So there are certainly some disturbing similarities between the Great Depression and what we are going through today. One commonality is the level of volatility in the stock market. Um, the swings that we see today uh, are beginning to rival what happened during 1929-1932. Now the stock market has stabilized since March, but if there is a worsening in the COVID epidemic, we might very well see more volatility in the stock market. Another similarity is that corporate earnings fell more than 70% during the Great Depression. If the economy continues to decline, we might see similar numbers in the near future. The 25% unemployment of the 1930s might be equaled today, again, if we enter into depression. But there are significant differences as well. During the Great Depression, the Federal Reserve Bank did next to nothing in trying to stop the crisis, even as it raised interest rates. Whereas today, in the current situation, the Federal Reserve has acted boldly to reduce interest rates, which makes mortgages more available, which makes loans easier. During the Great Depression, Congress tried to balance the budget and cut spending. But today, we're getting $2 trillion in fiscal rescue funds, 
plus and another $4 trillion in loans from the Federal Reserve. And in 1929, there was no such thing as Social Security. There was no Securities and Exchange Commission, no Medicaid, Medicare, no FDIC insurance or unemployment insurance. And so that's a big difference from today. Now, hopefully, this concerted action taken by the Fed and by Congress will mitigate the worst effects of the Great Depression of the 1930s. So, this is the end of my first lecture on the causes of the Great Depression.